So I came my first year as a sophomore, and that was my brother's mission trip. And then last year they went to Guatemala, and I've been looking forward to my trip for a couple years. I, I was looking forward to it. And then we learned it was going to be to Moldova, and we were so excited because we were going to Europe, and it was finally our mission trip. And then Mrs. Clark said, now it's time to start fundraising. I was like, oh no, where am I going to get $2,600? And I called my parents and I said, where am I going to get this money? We need to fundraise, we got to do something. And they said, okay, when you come home on Christmas break, we'll you know, do something, make a plan, and we'll come up with the money. I was like, I only have a couple of weeks, a month to do this in. We need to have a plan. Um, But I, I did go home and we put together a concert. My brother helped me and we did a concert at our church and I was able to share about Moldova. And God provided and people donated and I came up with what I needed. And so my worrying got me nowhere. Um, I had to trust my parents and trust God and he provided um, and blessed my fundraising. And trusting God ended up being kind of a reoccurring theme over this mission trip. Um, so then it was, it was time to go to Moldova, and we were really excited. We got up at like 4 o'clock in the morning, and then our plane got delayed, and then our plane got delayed, and then our plane got delayed. <laughs> but we finally left, and we got to Chicago. We met up with Miss Amy, and then we got on our eight-hour flight to, from Chicago to Frankfurt, Germany. And the three of us were sitting in a row, and I noticed that the young lady in front of us was in her 20s, and she was wearing a skirt. Not many people on the plane wearing skirts. But about halfway through the flight, Miss Amy was in the back taking a nap, because she can fit on the rows. <laughs> um, I was not napping. But the lady in front of us, uh, she turned around to Bianca and I, and she said, you guys are Jewish, right? Um, she said, you're wearing skirts, you're Jewish. I said, actually, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Have you heard of us? <laughs> and she said, no. So they explain. And I said, well, you know, we keep the Sabbath. And she said, how do you keep the Sabbath? She was kind of grilling me with questions. And I explained, you know, tried to bring out the similarities that I knew we would have. I said, we don't do any work and we... You know, study the Torah, the Bible, and we meet together and in a you know congregation assembly. And she was like, "Oh, okay." I said, "How do you keep Sabbath?" <laughs> Although she's Jewish and she's Jewish and she calls it Shabbos. Um, and she said, "Oh, well, you know, we don't do any work." I was like, "Oh, look at that." <laughs> and she told me about the little classes for children that they have. I was like, "Oh, it sounds like Sabbath school." And she told me all about it, and she wasn't too interested after that about what I believed. But I was able to talk to her a little bit, and she told me about being Jewish. And so I was trying to witness a little bit, even though I wasn't giving the gospel. I was trying to spread the name Seventh-day Adventist and try to show her kind of what we believe. And I don't know, maybe it'll go somewhere the next time she meets a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, but that was interesting. There were a lot of Jews on our flight headed from Germany to Tel Aviv, and so we were mistaken for Jews quite a few times because we were wearing skirts. Here, I don't think Tel Aviv It's okay. No. <laughs> Sorry. There, random strangers are trying to tell us where to go to get to the Tel Aviv flight. <laughs> So when we finally got to Moldova, and I mean finally, like it was a long flight, because I mean, I had never been on an airplane personally, so I mean, Ceci had experience with this, but I was completely and totally lost at the airport. So a nine hour flight was quite a jump from zero hours flying to nine. And we finally got there, Moldova is in between Romania and Ukraine. It's the tiny little purple country right there. Yeah. And we actually stayed 
in um, the capital, Chisinau, but the church that Ceci and I were um, having the evangelistic series in was actually in a town called Orhe, and that's where the little red, yeah, the little red thing <laughs> on the screen. Yeah, so that's where we had our um, evangelistic series. But one of the first things we noticed when we got to Moldova, I mean, we were expecting cold weather because they had told us, but I personally did not expect the snow. And Ceci and I are both from Texas, so we don't see snow all that often. Like, I remember the last time I saw snow was like when I was nine, and it actually snowed enough for me to say, oh, there's snow, you know? So when we got there, I was like, whoa, how am I going to get around? And it was so slippery. And it was actually really nice because, you know, all the snow until it turned to like a slushy texture. And it was just really muddy and messy. It melted after a few days. And then we just had mud for the rest of our trip. Yeah, but yeah it was sad. It was nice while it lasted. But because there were only two of us, usually the seniors just go by themselves. Like last year, they went to Guatemala, and they just went by themselves and stayed at a school and did mission work. But we couldn't really run a mission trip with just two or three of us. So we joined It Is Written, like Mrs. Clark was talking about. And that's not all five of us, but that's me and Bianca and what was his name? Pastor Douglas Naa from It Is Written. He was kind of in charge. and. Coral, the raw chef from California. She was there with us too, and Miss Amy. So this is a picture of our pastor. And when we first met the pastor, you know, we, we were in the car on our way back from the airport, because he picked us up from the airport, and we were in the car, and no, no, no. Oh, we're on yeah, our way to our first meeting. Church, yeah, church. it was on our way to our first, our first meeting. And, um, <coughs> Miss Amy asked him if he was going to be our translator, and he said yes. So um, we started trying to talk to him, and we figured out that he did not speak very much English at all. And we we're over here in the back seat freaking out because he doesn't speak English, and he's our translator. And um, yeah, we were we were like praying for the gift of tongues by the time we got to the church so that we could, you know, actually do something. And then when we got the, to the church, we realized that he didn't really understand our question at all and that our translator was at church. So, yeah. And we also got to meet his family. And, yeah, it was really nice to meet the pastor of the church. That's his family. That's not no, his that's family. Not that's not his family. family. No. no. Oh, never mind. Anything to say about Pastor Gima? He did try to take really good care of us. And uh, we tried to communicate through Google Translate, which is really handy. <laughs> and while he was driving, he would you know, talk into it, and he'd have me read it, and then I would try to, you know, say something back to him. So we were able to communicate some, and he really fell in love with us, and he took us to the airport. He wanted to make sure he was the one that takes the airport when we left, and stayed with us all the way until the flight took off, and so he, it, was a, it was a blessing to have him with us. I'm usually kind of shy with strangers, <laughs> but with Pastor Dima, I don't know, it was like the second time meeting him. We were driving the 50-kilometer trip between Orhe and our hotel in Chisinau. And we were just like belting out hymns in English, Spanish, and Romanian. <laughs> we had so much fun with him. And also in Moldova, they sing Psalm 46, God is our refuge. And so that's Bianca's favorite scripture song, so she'd always be humming it. It was always stuck in her head. And so we'd end up singing it, and the, whoever we were with were like, you know that song? And they'd start singing it in Romanian. I don't know what the words were if they were similar or what but that was cool he was kind of an aggressive driver and so we did a lot of praying while we were driving <laughs> he would literally on the icy roads be like passing people up the hills and going really fast and so and then are you going to say about the fog is it there no it's not okay so we were there about 14 days and we saw the sun two days every day it was so foggy you could hardly see from here to the door I mean, it was when you saw cars coming, especially at night. And so he's like still driving fast and passing cars, and we can't see anything. And so one day he looks over at me, and he's in the English he could say. He's like, can you see? And I'm like, no. And literally, we had just passed a, passed a car, 
and a semi comes poking its, its, its lights out of the fog. And he says, he looks over at me and he says, can you see? And I said, no. And he said, I can see. I said, well, good, you see, and I will pray. And he just laughed and laughed, but literally, I had just been praying. And there were not always enough seat belts in the car because the one in the middle didn't work, and so I'm like, okay, girls, I'm sitting in the middle because I've had a good life. And <laughs> so, but then sometimes, like one time, his wife and baby were in the front seat, no seat belts, and then his daughter, 12-year-old daughter, and all three of us were jammed in the back seat, I'm like, okay, let's just pray, but God protected. Um, one, one time he turned to us and he said, I like speed. <laughs> and we said, we can tell, because he would go like 90, 95 miles an hour in the fog at night. Yeah, we just closed our eyes, but... It made his wife worried, too. It was, yeah. We weren't the only ones. Uh, but I think he kind of adopted us. I, I didn't like to zip up my coat. It was just a hassle. But especially after I got sick, he would look at me, and he didn't know how to say, like, zip your coat, so he would just go, zip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I would zip my coat, you know, to here, and then he'd say, I had to zip it all the way up to my neck. <laughs> uh, but we, re we really like Pastor Dima. Yeah, we also met a bunch of other families at the church, and there was this one family that um, kind of cornered us. I think it was the Sabbath before we came, or last Sabbath there, and they're like, we want a picture with you so we can show our family like that we met Americans, and yeah, so they're like taking pictures with us and sending it to all like their family so they could say they met Americans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is another family that we got close to. I think this was like the head elder. We couldn't really tell, but he took over for the pastor sometimes. This is the Duca family. And anything to say about the Dukas? Um, they're really kind, and we saw quite a tran like a mm -hmm. difference in people's like how homes. These people had a really nice home. Like this is nicer than my house. But then the translator was like really poor, and they they had such a tiny little flat that had five, like the living room was their dining room, the, the three girls, including two teenagers, bedroom, and the living room, and it was very tiny. And so people, people live really poorly. It's actually one of the poorest country in Europe, or the poorest, poorest, poorest country yes, the poorest. in Europe. Many people, actually several, a couple hundred thousand people leave Moldova, they go to uh, other countries in Europe and they work illegally and send money back to their family and that's just how they, many of them survive. Uh, but this is us with the Duca family having tea. So we stayed at their house one Friday night on Sabbath and it was after lunch, right? They asked the same if she wanted tea and she said, sure, I'd like a cup of tea. And then she dozed for a minute, and then the hostess woke her up and said, okay, the tea's ready, and turned around, and the table's covered with, like, tea, like tea time. So there was, like, cake and chocolate and cookies and tea and juice, and we had another feast. They were very kind. And this is our translator, Daniela. <laughs> a different Daniela. And she was wearing this pretty blue dress that she wore every single time we saw her for two weeks because she only had one church dress. When we left, we tried to leave everything that we wouldn't need again or just that we could spare, and we just like gave her a whole suitcase full of like stuff for her family. She tried to give us <laughs> gifts too when we left, and she gave us like little figurines and stuff so that we could tell she had just gone through her house and tried to find things that she could give us. The what was it that she gave you? Dolphins. Oh, talking to the microphone. <coughs> oh yes, 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 the microphone. Um, <laughs> um, it was well, she gave us um, the the pen. And then some of the things she gave us, like you could tell, had been taken out of their own house. Like some of the decorations they had in their own house. And she gave me this um, little turtle sculpture thing. Yeah, it was a little glass turtle. It was really cute. With its head broken off. Yeah. 
but it was still cute. But that's all she had. <laughs> and they were so generous. You know, we saw their house and that they didn't have anything. Her husband had been a teacher, but then he didn't have a job. She tutored English. Um, but they gave us a feast of cabbage rolls, and then they saw we were tired, and they said, take a nap, and they let us sleep on their bed, and when we woke up, they had chocolate waiting for us. They were just very generous. Oh, yeah, so um, we also, um, w one of the days, one of the pastor's friends took us to, you know, just see the sights in the capital, and we went to a couple of um, Russian Orthodox cathedrals, and that was really interesting to see because it just, um, like, we actually got to see some people worshiping in it and, like, singing, and, you know, it was, it was interesting. So I didn't get a picture of the, what do you call this, like a shrine, shrine. that was inside the cathedral, but it, it looked pretty much like this. It had Jesus, and we asked about the two ladies at the bottom, we asked Pastor Dima, and he said, Maria and Maria Magdalena, or something like that. So, Mary and Mary Magdalene, and they had this in the cathedral, and there was one man, we were just kind of walking around, we weren't supposed to be taking pictures, but we got a picture, and we saw this man that was, like, praying in front of the shrine, and he would, like, what was he doing? Feet. Yeah, he and would like kiss the feet of Jesus in the picture yeah. and then he would like bow and touch the ground and stand back up and make the sign of the cross just like repeat it over and over and over and like touching them. It kind of reminds you of how much darkness is in the world mm -hmm. and how many people need Jesus. But shrines like these were all over the place. You would see them like on the sidewalk, on the corner of the street, you were just driving by and these shrines were everywhere. Um, and often they were by a well. They had a lot of wells there, especially in the village, which is like out in the country. So we live in the village, so out here in Wachita Hills. <laughs> That's what they called the people who lived in the country. They lived in the village. And where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. Um, some of the villages didn't have running water, so they still had wells. And we saw these shrines a lot by the wells. I never actually saw anybody like worshiping at these shrines, but they were all over the place. Oh yeah, and this was, it was called Old Orge, some, what's the word I'm looking for? Like archeological excavation oh, yeah. site where they were finding things, but it was some fortress city that was kind of dug into the rock, and this was one of the things that, it was a cave, and it was a monastery in there. So in this picture you can see one of the monks in there, and where he is, is kind of a different section, and we couldn't go in there because we didn't have our heads covered, and we were girls, so we didn't go in there. It was kind of like dug into, it was like a cave, and it was like dark in there, so you went to this passageway for a long time, it was totally dark, we had flashlights on our phone actually, and just feeling, you know, hoping in, down steps, way down there. And there was, there was a, a window, you can see some light coming in, but it was just like pretty much a, a church in darkness. So people would go down there and worship, light their candles, but there was this man that he was like the monk there, and mm -hmm. he had lived there for what, 12 years or something? I think it was 16. 16 12. years. Can you imagine living in darkness for that long? Yeah, he was only like 72 70. He looked or something. like he was like 100. He yeah. had white hair, and it was curly and long, and he just looked squinty looked like and Santa old Claus. and wrinkled because he just lived down there in the darkness for 16 years and hardly saw the light. There was supposed to be a balcony, but it, it broke, broke or something. Yeah. The door, they couldn't go to the balcony, so they just <clears throat> lived down there. And they had bread and water. That was about all the food I saw. Maybe some like jelly or something. Um, I don't know if they actually used this part anymore. Probably. They probably did, but they let us go kind of around the corner. There was supposed to be stairs there, but they had kind of crumbled a long time ago. So we crawled across this tiny ledge over to where this area was. And these are little cubicles carved in the rock where the monks would study and pray. And in, in the dark. Yeah, in the dark. 
the ceiling was about five feet tall there. And I could stand up just fine. Yeah, th <laughs> so could I. They didn't have much of an issue. But <laughs> the point of it being so low was because they, it was supposed to make you hunch over like I had to, to fit in there because it was supposed to keep you in a constant prayer position. So that was the monastery. Yeah, so for me, seeing all of this, like vis visiting the monastery, just brought home to me again why, why we were in Moldova. Mm -hmm. our, our mission there was like to help people see that their life didn't have to be like that dark. And yeah, this is... Um, Ceci actually preaching the adult evangelistic series, and I took care of the children's meetings. Yeah, that's yeah. children's meetings with my translator. Her translator was, how old was Amy, 16? 16. Yeah, she was my translator's daughter, and she spoke five or six languages. Yeah. <laughs> she, we were like, wow, because she learned Korean and French, and she said, oh, it's not that hard. <laughs> Fluent, though, in no, she yeah. wasn't extremely fluent, but she was more fluent in English than we were in Romanian, so we appreciated her. But so the first Saturday we got there was it Thursday or Friday? Thursday. Thursday. So then Friday we had just to rest, which was good, because we were up about 27, 28 hours on the flight there. Um, but we got there, we went to church, and. Um, Pastor Dima said, okay, one of you is doing children's story and one of you is preaching the sermon. <laughs> um, which we weren't prepared for, so Miss Amy pulled the sermon out of her hat and I told the children's story. And then that night we actually started the evangelistic series and I had the first sermon on, I think it was Daniel 2 probably. And I think it was that night I woke up at about 2 o'clock in the morning and I knew I was sick. I was just burning up. I was like, oh, maybe I'll go to sleep and it'll be gone by morning. I woke up in the morning and I was definitely sick. So Miss Amy preached for me for, I think, three days. I just didn't leave my bed. I don't know what I had or where I got it. I got it in Moldova, but <laughs> it was really bad. We didn't have a thermometer, but I know I had a fever and I was just in bed for like three days. Um, so they would go every afternoon at about 4 o'clock, the pastor would pick us up, drive to the church, have some time to prepare, have the meeting, go to a restaurant to eat, and then come back. So they were gone from about 4 to 9 or 10 every night. So I was alone in the hotel room. But Miss Amy gave me my phone back so I could keep in contact with my parents while I was there. And my mom contacted the people at our church, the people here, um, like any friends we had, and she would send me a list. She said, these are all the people that are praying for you. She sent me a list of just like all these names, and then she would send me like updated, like, oh, I contacted these people, and they're praying for you. At the end, I think it was like 100 people. Was it less than that? Oh, I don't know. I remember 100 that were praying for me, and I know many of you were too. I've seen my name on that prayer request board, and I'm very grateful for that because it got me through those three days. And after that, I was able to get out of bed and go back to preaching for a while. Um, I was still kind of sick, but I got over it, so that was good. And then Pastor Dima really made me zip up my coat. <laughs> and Bianca. And Bianca, even though she never got it, which is not fair, but... Oh yeah, so um, the first Sabbath we were there, Pastor Dima figured out that Ceci and I could both play the guitar and sing. So he's like, oh, do you want to do special music? And we said yes, and then he said five. No, he said three. Oh, no, he said five. Oh. <laughs> we only did three. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, he said five, and we said, oh, five. And he's like, okay. So we were, we were stuck doing, we only did three though. We only did three, but he asked us for five, so this is us. Singing. We did, um, I think, two in English and one in Spanish, and yeah. They have the song Masaya del Sol in Romanian, 
I don't know what the words are, if they have to do with the same thing, but we knew that they would at least know the tune, and so they would be thinking the lyrics in their head, they would get some blessing from it. So we did some in English and some in Spanish, and they didn't really care that they couldn't understand them, they just wanted music, so we were like, okay. <laughs> So I forgot this lady's name, but we became friends, and she was <laughs> she was from the village. A lot, of, actually, most of the visitors that came were from the, what they call the villages, and they they live more primitively. It's harder to find work, so they pretty much live off what they grow and their animals. And so they have wood heat. They go to the well for water. Um, it's just a harder life, and so a lot of times they you know smelled like wood heat and. Um, it was fine with me and anyway so this lady um, one night when they were at she was at the meeting her house burned down and so the church was c collecting up an offering to or clothes and things to give her um, thankfully she had another house I mean it's kind of strange that they have like kind of two houses some of them of course they're probably not very nice houses but anyway she one night she was talking to me and she just talk 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 and she I she had no I clue like she couldn't understand how I couldn't understand her, and so I called a, a, a translator over, and he was he was kind of laughing, and he was saying, "I don't want to tell you what she's saying." And finally, I was like, "I can figure it out." She has a son in Czech Republic that I need to marry, and I was like, um, "Logistics probably would not work out real well." But this lady is actually 70 years old. She's my parents' age. Um, people there, it seems like they age really young, partly because they have such a hard life, and I think partly, at least there was, a, there was another gentleman who was Romanian from California, and he was preaching in another town, and he said, it's their mind, it's their mindset. When they reach 50, they just think they're old and they just quit doing anything. They just can't do anything anymore. And here he was, like, I don't know, 75 or something, and he was still traveling, preaching, building, and he, he had, they asked him to have a sermon about his life so that they could kind of get a different picture in their mind of what an old person can do. And so even though this lady was just 70 years old, she just seemed a whole lot older. And um, hopefully, eventually, maybe their mindset will change some so that they can enjoy life longer, <laughs> live longer. If I remember correctly, she had been Adventist, right? I think about so. About 20 years before, but she wasn't really going to church. Uh, but when she came to the meetings, she decided to be baptized. You know, there was an altar call and invited them to come to the front. And I can't remember if she came or whether she just she sat. She came. Oh, time. yeah. One and then time. I think the pastor made another one. And she said, I don't want to get up from my chair, but I, I want to be baptized. But yeah, and that's the whole church. It wasn't a small church, especially with all the visitors. We had about 25 visitors, including a lot of children going to Bianca's meetings that were coming. And a lot of kids, they would just, like there's a whole bus that came from these villages and they stopped and everyone got out at the meeting. And a lot of kids came without their parents. And so one night I was down there, like I think the last Friday night, and there was probably 20 visiting children and a lot of them didn't have parents with them. They just wanted to come. So the, the bus driver from this just public transportation, after two weeks, he knew he picked up this whole group in the village, brought them to our meeting, and he knew about what time we would get out. And so he would be waiting for them when they got out. And the last night, it went a little bit long because the pastor found a bunch of Ellen White books and some Bibles in Romanian and Russian because a lot of people are bilingual. Um, and so he decided to hand them out on the last night. So... I think he gave some books to the people who were being baptized, and then he said, you know, who would like a copy of Desire of Ages or whatever books they were? And because it was taking so long, the bus driver was tired of waiting for all of his people to transport, so he came into the church to sit and wait. And he came in just as the pastor was saying, okay, we have one Bible left, who would like it? And he walked in, and the pastor said, oh, would you like our last Bible? And I think he asked for a couple of the Ellen White books after that, so the bus driver... He hadn't come to any of the other meetings, um, but he left with a Bible and some Ellen White books, too. Anything to say about him? 
These are the people who got baptized um, on the last Sabbath. The two men actually had been, had been studying to be baptized um, already, and it was the, in the plan. The lady, she, the year before, she had decided to be baptized, but she had just changed her mind, gotten uh, cold feet, I don't know what. And so um, the translator and the pastor said, please pray, please pray that she doesn't change her mind this time. And so during the week that the girls were preaching, she decided again to be baptized, and she was baptized um, that last day. Do you have a picture of all those who came forward? No. So there was about five, I think, addition to these that said we want to study and we want to be baptized at the next baptism. So that was, I mean, just standing there, like watching them go forward and just realizing that you had some tiny little part in someone making an eternal decision, a decision that will affect their eternity. It was like there really is no greater joy, and it was just a big blessing. So when we had the baptisms today, it reminded me of this. And you know how at the baptisms today we would sing one verse of a hymn and then have the baptism the way they did it was, they would sing too, but it was after they were baptized. As soon as they come, came out of the water, they would start, I think it's Battle Hymn of the Republic, they also had a Romanian. So as soon as they came out of the water, it was Gloria, Gloria, Alleluia, for every single one of them. <laughs> Um, but it reminded me of that today. I wanted to start singing, but I didn't. <laughs> um, and that's the church. We really enjoyed our time in Moldova, and we learned a lot. Um, for me, one of the main things I learned was that God doesn't expect us to have it all together. He doesn't expect us to be perfect. You know, if I had messed something up, that's not... God doesn't ask us to do everything. He just wants us to be willing. And when we trust him, we're willing, we do what he asks. He takes care of the hard part. I just had to get up there and preach a sermon. He moved on the people's hearts. So that's one of the main things I learned. One of the things I learned was to trust completely in God because I'm a very, very extremely shy person. So I, I get up front and I would get stage fright and like start shaking and not be able to get anything out of my mouth. So going to Moldova and actually like talking to the kids and giving an entire series for the kids was really a test for my faith in God. And I had to really trust him to tell me what to say because I didn't know what to say. And one of the other things I learned that really impacted me was the generosity of the people in Moldova. It was, it was amazing how, especially like um, our translator's family, they'd invite us to their house and they wouldn't, they weren't like, oh, you know, my house is such a mess and I don't have anything to give them. They would just invite us and they, didn't, they just gave us whatever they had. And it really reminded me that I am so blessed and that I should be thankful for every little thing that I have because there are people out there who don't have what I have. So um, in one of the pictures at the beginning, there was a lady named Coral, mm -hmm. and Coral had come from, from California. She, did, um, she was a retired nurse, I'm not sure exactly where she got money, but she, like her year was booked up on trips, so she stayed home some. But she went on lots and lots of mission trips, and she said, oh, I've been here, and I've been, it's so interesting to talk to her. And she, most of them were, were medical trips, but she also, this was a preaching trip and she wanted to do more. So it was really interesting to talk to her. And later I was thinking, man, what a nice life. If I had, uh, I mean, I really love this trip. I love the preaching part and I, I would love, if, if I had an uh, infinite supply of time and money, man, I would do that too. It'd be so nice. But then I was thinking more about it and I was like, you know what? We don't have to go to Moldova. We can reach people right in our neighborhood, the people we, we run into, God can give us divine appointments. And I was trying, I told you something uh, earlier about my neighbors, and there was this one neighbor right after I moved, my brother told me about her, she was right next to me, and she had, her husband and her believed a lot of Adventist message, and they'd been to church a couple times, but then they quit coming. And so um, I wanted to meet her, but just life got in the way, and I was busy, and and I never went to her house, you know, it's kind of awkward. And so I just hadn't, hadn't met her, and, by the, and it was November. And it was Friday afternoon, and I am very, like, 
driven as far as what I need to get done. And that day I was baking birthday cakes for my brothers and I was, you know, I needed to mow the lawn and clean the house and do all these things. And she knocked on the door and I'm like, come in and have a seat. I'm so happy to meet you, which I was, I was happy to meet her. And she sat down and talked and talked for four hours. It was Sabbath by the time she was she left. And I should have said, if I knew her better, I would say, hey, come in the kitchen, you know. But I was just, I didn't. And so I was like, do you know what? Sometimes or all the time, people are more important than all the things I need to get done. And so God's teaching me, and I also learned through Moldova and through Coral that, that God has a mission field everywhere we are, and he will help us to connect with the people in our sphere of influence. Thank you for coming and listening and praying and giving. I, I thought just before you leave, as they were talking, of one other real providence and blessing I wanted to share, and it, it is regarding their trip. Um, the day they were going to leave Chicago, and normally I would not ever in the winter schedule anybody to fly through Chicago. However, they, I did not want them meeting Amy in Europe, and Chicago was the only um, airport that they could fly f through and meet. They could fly differently, but anyway, that, that, was, that was the issue we were dealing with. And Chicago, the day before, had had snow, and more was going to be fall and fell that night, and it was very questionable that they were going to get out. And um, there were just several complicating factors. We weren't sure Amy would even at first get there. And, you know, I just prayed, Lord, what do we do? I talked to the travel agent, and he was suggesting, well, send them through Houston and send her through Boston, and there's no problem. And I said, nope, it doesn't work that way. We can't do that. And, um, well, we could reschedule the flights, and the, then that's gonna, they're going to miss the first few nights of their meeting because then they weren't going to be getting there in time, and that didn't seem like a good alternative either. And, um, and, and the Lord gave me peace, and we decided we were just going to go ahead with the plan. There was a possibility that afternoon they would still get out. For a while, Amy's flight was delayed, to canceled and even getting her there. And then what do I do if I got two girls there? Anyway, the Lord gave us peace and he worked it out and they met and flew together. So that was another way I saw him answer prayer. One more thing. So when we were landing, it was like foggy, like normal. And they kind of circled a little bit and then we, we kind of landed in, slid around a little bit. Everyone on the plane started clapping. Evidently, the day before the flight, um, it had been so foggy that it had just gone back to Frankfurt. So all those people were really hoping to land that day. And so we were glad we landed safely in Frankfurt. Everything was white. I mean, literally, you look, it's all white. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Father in heaven, I thank you for the way you have blessed us this school year and especially blessed the seniors and Amy in Moldova. And we know that they sowed precious seed. I pray that even now you will continue to water that seed and that there will be many in the kingdom for their time there. Now we ask that you will um, bless us as we begin a new week that what we do will be to your honor and glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen.